Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And it is my goal to bring you thought leaders and influencers and best-selling authors that can help you, you know, find a little bit closer to your passion and your career or in building your company culture. So today on the show, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bill Donahue. Bill has dedicated his career to developing high performance teams and uncovering practices that produce transformational leaders. Bill is the author of the best-selling book, Leading Life, Changing Small Groups, and he is also the co-author of Coaching Life, Changing Leaders with Greg Bowman. Bill joins us today to discuss aligning personal strengths with organizational opportunities to strengthen your career path. Bill, I am so excited that you're here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Casey. Good to be here. This is fun. This is so exciting. So, okay, I always start the show, and this may be a little brain tickler, I don't know, with sharing how we got connected. Because I think in life, your network and who you know is sure. it's your currency. Sure is. So do you remember how we got connected? Well, through Kayleen. Yes. And I remember that. Yes. And yes. you had interacted with her and she sent me a note and one thing led to another and it was just uh, like I think providential uh, because we share a lot in common of what we're trying to do and, and Kayleen's just the quintessential networker and uh, she made the introduction. So yeah, that's great. And you know, what's so interesting here that I want to point out is that she was introduced to me by somebody else in my network. So Frank Agan, I don't know if you know him. Yeah, I don't know Frank. See, that's just how it works though. Exactly. And so I always tell people, take that conversation because even if it doesn't make sense to you and you don't know why somebody's making that connection for you, it may be the next person or that next person may introduce you to the next person. And then you're going to go, Absolutely. oh, that's why I was supposed to meet them. Excellent. So you nailed it. You don't really know until <laughs> you look back, right? You see the stream or the ripple effect and you go, wow. Exactly. Exactly. And she's um, just a great leader. She's energetic. She's good at connecting people. And it's not unusual that that's how I got connected to you. So, and it's Kayleen Marshall, right? Yeah, correct. Kayleen Marshall. In case people want to look her up, but since she is sure. such a great person to be connected with, great we're coach. Mm -hmm. Definitely give her a shout out and tag her on all our social media. And okay. Thanks for introducing us to you. So, um, so I really want to dig in. We've got a lot of questions for you today um, to share with our audience. And I think it's just going to be okay. invaluable. So, you know, how can a person identify their top professional skills? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I like to think of probably two ways in which people do that. One would be feedback and one would be personal insight. So let's start with the feedback question. Uh, sometimes it takes a colleague or a family member or a friend, uh, someone who says, you know, you're really good at that, or you do that well, or maybe you're in one of those sort of semi-performance interview things uh, where they're giving you some feedback in that way. Um, feedback's a real gift. And for someone to be able to say, you know, I noticed something in you, but I think one of the things we don't often do is invite it. Sometimes it's given to us whether we want it or not. And sometimes it's invited. So I would encourage people particularly friends and family, people that you have some level of trust with or relationship, or you can kind of let your hair down, so to speak, and say, hey, can I, can I just ask you a question? If you had to say the top two or three things I'm good at, what would they be? And don't even say maybe professional skills yet. Just see, because what I found with sometimes in a family or a friend, they're not thinking professionally and they'll use different language to articulate something. They might say, oh, I don't know, you're really good at getting people to, to know each other and get connected. They may not use the word networking, you know, or something like that. So I think those folks who are closest to us and see us in a lot of different environments might see skills in us we don't know that we actually could use or should use professionally. And then of course, there's just professional feedback. Quick story, I sat down with the boss in a, a situation where we had a new supervisory relationship. He said, Bill, I'd like to give you basically some feedback. I said, sure. He said, I got a question for you. How come 
you spend about 80% doing something that you're okay at, but not that great at, and only 20% of your time doing what you're really good at. Crickets, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, new reporting relationship, three months into it, I'm thinking, what's going to come next? And he was great. He was a great uh, boss, but he said, you know, I watch how you teach and train and engage people, and I go, wow. The audience is there and they're, they're captivated and, and you're, you're in your element, you're having dialogue. And then I watch this leadership thing you're trying to do over here and I almost feel like you're trying to be somebody. I feel like you're trying to, I don't know if you use the word perform, but in other words, I was trying to do something in a certain way. And the reason I was trying to do that was to impress the CEO of the company because that's the way the CEO did it. And in fact, he was saying, don't be that guy. <laughs> And I would say to people, don't be that gal, don't be that guy, be you. Uh, and what is it that gets you excited? And what does feedback say is you're good at that. And here, again, it wasn't necessarily invited. I would say for 24 hours, I hated him, you know, because he nailed me, right? But then I thought about it, I thought, wow, he is spot on. I come to life when I'm doing this, and this is drudgery over here. So uh, that goes to my second point with it, which is the personal side. Uh, as we reflect with our own insights, you know, what is it as we just sit back and have that quiet time or whatever we think, you know, what do I love to do? Where do I get in affirmation? Where do people come and say, hey, thanks for doing that? Uh, where do I find a level of success? You know, what I do works. Outcomes happen and things take place and projects are developed and people are served. And, you know, and, and the last thing on the personal side, I would just say joy. Where do you, where do you find joy in it? I had a, a professor one time say to me, Every job has its bedpans, <laughs> but he said, generally speaking, wherever you find joy in doing something, I bet your work should be tied to that in some way. So that personal reflection, as well as the feedback will help you identify skills that I think you can go, okay, in light of the role or in light of the job that I want, how can I use some of those skills? You know, this is a perfect example of how we align so well and why, you know, we're talking today because that's one yeah. of the things, you know, my passion is to help others find their career passion. Right. And I ask them those very same questions. I'm like, why, what makes you excited to get out of bed in the morning? Absolutely. You know, what's going to make you excited to go to work and, you know, really reflect back on it. And probably the best piece of advice that somebody gave me along those lines was think about what you like to do when you were a little kid. And I was like, I would put boxes together and build a stage and stand on them and perform for the neighborhood. <laughs> but that tells you something, right? Uh, it's, you know, I did one of these things, this was many years ago, I date myself, I won't say when, but uh, there was an organization that you, you did this by paper back in the day. You wrote out eight stories and they gave you a few criteria for them, one pagers, and they gave you seasons of life. And they said, here's the only thing about the stories. You produced something, you made or did something, you enjoyed it, and others said, I think that's pretty good. That's all the criteria of it. It could be in fifth grade, it could be when you're 10 years old or fifth, you know, high school. Try to, and they gave you again some eras of life and said, pick one from these different eras and 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 tell your story, tell why you liked it, what you did, and so on. And, and they said, really, it can be a project, it could be something you did at home, it could be something you've done at work, it didn't matter. And I remember taking about eight of these things, and one was refinishing a desk and one was uh, redesigning a, a training manual. Another one was a, a talk I had given somewhere. Very different things. None of which said that's what you should do for a living. But what they did was they looked at all of it and they traced a line through it. They said, ah, here's the feedback we want to give you. And they had a bit of a report they gave you. And it was basically, you like to take things that have potential and turn them into great things. And I thought, that's it. You know, that's me. That's, that's a big part of me. There's some nuancing to it. But that's me, whether it was refinishing that desk that I used when I went to graduate school. I didn't want to refinish desks the rest of my life. I probably did a fairly crummy job at it from a <laughs> professional standpoint. But I took something for five bucks that looks like a $400 desk, stripped it down and cleaned it up and I made it mine. And that was it for that project. But what I noticed in everything else I did, it was I was helping bring transformation and change to a life or to an, uh, an environment or whatever and make it better, draw its strengths out and make it better. I wasn't always the inventor of it, but I could take something and see, ah, potential there. I can work with that. And so that really helped me. And it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about. You look back at those stories of life 
and where you got feedback from people or where, where you did something like you described what you did and you go, you know, maybe there's something there. You know, and that is so true. And I love that you recognize that you take things and go from good to great, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm probably like before you because I'm the person and I know this from every single assessment that I've ever taken um, that will have the big ideas and throw them out there for other people to work on. Right. You know, right. and so and I know that's my strength. I know I'm, my strength is not in the details. You know, I just want to, I want to see the big picture and I want somebody else to like drill down and make it work. So, sure. that, yeah. so we could be and a great key. partner. Self-knowledge is really key. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, and I mean, that really leads me to my next question. So what you're saying is, you know, you got that feedback from your supervisor at one point and then you did this yeah. assessment, which I thought was really cool. Why is it so difficult to gauge your own professional abilities? Yeah, that's a great question because I think what happens with people is they tend to be plus or minus on reality. They either think they're better than they really are or they're terrible at something. And, you know, someone else says, oh, no, I don't, I don't think so. You know, they give a presentation or they do something. They say, oh, that was awful. So, I don't know, three people behind me and myself were sitting there saying, wow, you really nailed it. Oh, you know, so again, I go back to that feedback. We may hit that drum a few times here, but the sense of uh, it's hard to gauge because we're not good at, at assessing. We, we have biases. And I like to think we have biases and we have blind spots. Mm. So on the bias side of things, we either tend to see things a certain way or it, interpret it ahead of time with a certain reality. Again, it could be up, it could be down. It, it tends to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, some of those biases too are influenced by our background and culture. We have biases, as we know, as we look at a lot that we're talking about in our culture today, right? Racial biases generational biases, uh, gender bias, style bias, leadership style bias, cultural bias. Not all biases are bad or evil. They're just what they are. And it, it's hard to assess what my skills are or the effectiveness of them if I'm biased and I don't even know I have it. And that carries over into my comment about blind spots. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to think I'm good at something and I may not be. I remember, uh, you know, I, I did some graduate school work around sort of the faith space and did some church work many, many years ago and took some graduate school in theology and psychology and other things. And part of what we did was communicate. So you would give five and 10 minute talks and people would critique you. And we had this one guy, he would stand up and he really wanted to be, I think, a preacher. He was like, I want to be a preacher. I thought, oh, it's a great aspiration you've got there. Uh, and he's, he would give illustrations like this. He would say, and of course, we want to reach the whole world. And he would do that instead of the whole world. You know, it was like always the opposite <laughs> of whatever he was trying to say. And he said, let's take the long view of this. No, no, take the long view of this. <laughs> His gestures never lined up. And what was interesting was he really thought he was good at what he was doing, but the students had to sit there and be honest and say, I, I think I think you think you're, you're good at something and you're really not good. You might be good at one aspect of communication, but maybe this isn't it. So he had a blind spot on the fact that his body language and gestures didn't correlate with what he was saying. So he'd be the kind of person telling a really sad story, but smiling while he did it, you'd think, that's odd. I've seen that. I don't know if you've know, you know, seen that. Sometimes people are smiling and are talking about something really serious and really awful, and you're thinking, that's weird. <laughs> uh, but those kinds of blind spots. So when it comes to the technical skills we have, we're trying to say, am I good at sales or am I good at marketing or am I the kind of person who should be making the deal or financial management? back to feedback again i need others to really speak into that because by myself it's hard now the advantage we had in sports i played college and high school football was we had game film and that was reality check time <laughs> that was you know you thought you played pretty well and the coach would say well you got a 70 out of 100 this week and you thought oh i thought i was about a 90 and you look at what you're doing and you realize you were not following certain assignments and you did certain things you need to improve how you do this or that and I think, what's the game film that we have today? It's hard to get that, isn't it? It's really hard to get you in action. So I would invite that as much as possible because it is hard to gauge and there are barriers to it. And again, biases, prejudices, and again, I don't mean that always negatively. It's just what we, what we have. So we need people to kind of say, hey, you gave a talk. Here's some feedback. Hey, you did a presentation. Hey, hey, you created a strategic plan. Can I give you some pointers on how you lay that out next time, try this order instead of this order. So that's where coaching comes in. That's why I love it is that we can help people gauge the effectiveness of what they're doing, give them honest feedback, and then help them learn skills to take the next steps. But it's hard. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I know that I probably have several blind sites and I'm just curious, blind sites? How about blind spots? You're thinking of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but, so uh. I'm sure I have plenty of blind spots and I'm sure other people out there do. And so from what I just heard you say, just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, that's where that feedback comes in, right? To right. help you identify those blind spots blind spots. Why can I not say that word today? That, um, you know, that you don't even know that you have. Yeah. One of them for me is because it, the, the blind spots sometimes are related to our strengths. You wouldn't think that, but it can be, right? So when I coach people, I'm working with them sometimes on a particular assessment tool. We use shows them what can go wrong with overused strengths. So when, when, when stress builds or energy is required, Teachers talk too much. Leaders push too hard. Uh, we don't know what we're doing. We don't think we don't think it's wrong because we're in our strength. We're in our lane, and and that part of us that's really good that says in our brain, you know what? They need answers right now to this problem. You know how to teach, so talk your way into that. Mm -hmm. And so blah 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 blah. And you're doing that. Everybody else is. I have an idea. Can we jump in? Uh, are you listening to anything anyone else is saying? And thinking I'm helping because I'm in my strength. I'm not even doing it consciously. It's just what I do. So the blind spots can be ignored areas that I should grow in. Like, hey, you really need to learn some EQ here when you meet a new person. You're kind of abrupt and direct. You're not warm. And, you know, or it could be, hi, you know, <laughs> boom. <laughs> the person that says, I'd love to meet new people. Yes, and you trample them <laughs> as, you can, as you can connect with them. You know, it's like they have no idea that they're so strong in their strength, that that actually creates a blind spot and they're unable to hear or think or hear new ideas or hear the great things others are doing because they're so caught up with themselves. You know, I love that you just said that because I'm just going to be very transparent and vulnerable for a moment because that was actually my blind spot and mm. was being that abrupt and direct and not when I'm in casual conversations, but when I'm in work mode work and mode. Yeah. I'm like head to head down, you know, yeah. to the grindstone, all that kind of stuff. I I will talk to you, but I have like a whole different demeanor. And so sure. and my boss had to come to me and say, you know, you can be a little short with people when you're working and you're in your zone. Yeah. And I had to really take time to stop to make sure that I wasn't, you know, that I, I was being a good team player. So I, I appreciated that feedback. Yeah. So the, I was coaching a senior leader in a pharmaceutical company. She's dynamic. She's great. But it was helping her understand that there are times for direct and blunt kind of feedback, especially where you've done coaching. The person keeps making the same mistake over and over, and you have to say, hey, I need, I need to say this to you. It cannot happen again. You know, there's a time for that. But because she could be direct and that had its strength again, she could also not know how to deliver that sort of more tender or nuanced feedback and say, hey, uh, I want to walk this through with this. And I'm going to point out a couple things that are that are problems, but we can fix them. And I'm going to show you how to you know, work on that. So the next time you do it, we could be a step forward for you. That opens me up because I'm already like, oh no, my boss says I'm doing something mm -hmm. wrong. I, I already have the bad feeling going on. I don't need you to you know, drive it into me. But this is to know that I tend to be blunt. So I'm going to put sort of a qualifier on this, not pulling back from the truth, but just in the way and style in which I deliver it. So can I give you a little feed? Just like my boss did. He could have said, Bill, you're really bad at this. You're really good at this. Stop doing this. See ya. You know, he could have done that. Right. But he didn't do that. He said, I watch you flourish over here. And I got excited about that. He said, but, but I have a question over here. And I walked away feeling the impact of it, but it wasn't a punch. It was kind of more of a little nudge. And so that's what you're talking about there. Absolutely. So let's say you're feeling like you, um, like you aren't being challenged or fulfilled in your role that you're in currently. Um, how can you align your skills and interests to find other opportunities within the same organization? You know, we don't like to jump, most of us don't like to jump jobs. Sure. Yeah, the company or organization, wherever you're working is large enough that there's uh, other opportunities within it. Absolutely. So I, you would do the normal things, check the company's own website that it puts out to the world, you know, to see what they're posting. Uh, you know, if depending on the safety factor that you feel talking with people about it, what the protocol is, and that varies sometimes, but you know, talk to someone in HR and say, Hey, here's some, here's some things I'm feeling. I think I have some strengths. Let me lay them out. I'd like to use those maybe somewhere else in the organization. What, what could I explore? 
I think you can do some of those kinds of what I would call normal or typical things, but generally don't be afraid to ask. I was in a situation, I may have alluded to it earlier, what, uh, what working at a bank, I was new and um, realized that a particular organizational slash training manual we were using was frankly kind of cumbersome. I had been through it and I thought, boy, this could be organized differently. This, this goes back to my, my line that goes through everything, right? And I saw potential for this to be just so much better. Not perfect. It's not a perfectionism thing. It's just say, seeing, wow, if they put section four over in section two, that would prepare people for section three. Instead, we're learning it on the back end where we've already, and it does, that's why it doesn't make sense to us, that kind of thing. So I asked a question. I said, do you mind if I go reorganize? And this is it's a little cocky, but it was kind of reorganize or basically the training manual for this division, you know, the company. And they were like, take a shot at it. And I'm sure they thought, yeah, he'll start that and they'll never hear from him again. So I did present my findings and kind of gave it an overview and handed it. So a couple of days later, I got a call, come to my office. So I came in and sat down. The associate director was there next to this guy and he and she were the leaders of this whole department division. And uh, the guy put the thing on the table in front of me. He had put it in a three rig binder. He put little tabs on it where he'd made notes. And he started out like this, he goes, this is the best piece of work I've seen in our department in like three years. <laughs> it's just like that. And he said, would you like to fully work on this and really change it? And we'll work with you on it so we can think about the way we train developing leaders in the organization. And I, I tell that story not to be a big whatever. It was more ask. Sometimes you just need to ask, hey, I have this ability. I'd like to use it. Can I give it a shot here? Can I help you with that strategic development? Can I help you make sales calls? Can I, whatever. Most of our areas in our work and our businesses need help. Mm -hmm. And the offer of being willing to help and using some gifts or abilities in that way is, is often received well, or at least it, it generates a conversation. So one thing I would say is ask. Ask if there's a way, ask if you can make a way. But the second one is, is make a job, you know, actually create one. And related to that story, I won't tell the whole story, but I was in another setting. This is kind of my development and training hat again. Uh, I saw an opportunity where they didn't even have a training department. People were just given things to do and given some quick feedback and an evaluation and off they went. And here came the next project down. They never really knew, had, have I done it well? Could I do it better? Nothing like that. And there was no pre-work like you talked about earlier, no pre-that. <laughs> um, so I said, I'm going to offer you guys something. What if we create a role and I take it? I'll, I'll give you the job description, what the outcomes could be. I'll try to work up what I think costs would be to have it, but I'm going to show you what I think the impact's going to be and why it's worth every penny of it to do it. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I just think, I just think I can offer something to the organization. So it took what I just described before up to a higher level. I actually created a job and said, I'd like to go do that. And I think <laughs> I'd be better at it. So that's a little pushy, but I think in companies, again, that are looking for people that are movers and trying to you know, help the company do, they, they would, I think, at least say, person's really trying to help us here. And maybe something, maybe it's not the whole job. Maybe they say, let's add 20%, you know, to what you're doing and maybe take hopefully 20% away. So you can focus on this a little more. You might be able to create your own. You know, and I think that is so true. And I'm, I, again, just want to share just a real quick personal example, because, you know, I've been with VIP for a little over three years now, and I can tell you with complete certainty, I am not doing a single thing they hired me to do. Yeah. So My job typical. has completely yeah. morphed. You know, it's Absolutely. like, and, and, and I love that, you know, and that's when you're talking about that safe space, this is exactly what you're talking about because I would have an idea. I want to do a podcast. What do you guys think? Well, we'll give it a shot. And here we are two years later, yeah. you know, yeah. and I went to coaching school, not with the intent to do it through VIP, but I went through coaching school and got certified. And now I'm launching a whole new vertical within the business for coaching. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and your story is great. I, I know. And so, I mean, it's just, it's a completely different path than what I thought it was going to look like when I started with VIP, but I will have to tell you, it's a much happier path. So much yep. happier. So a I would- A CEO friend of mine that lives down the street uh, is not, uh, he and I meet we, almost weekly. He's actually not CEO anymore, but he's involved in so many other mm -hmm. things. Uh, he's not retired. He's one of those kind of people. Just uh, a, a great, amazing person. But he said, remember, Bill, first of all, this job is not your last job and your next job is not your last job. Generally speaking, it might be, but he was saying, you know, you might get offered something that gets you 50% of what you'd love to do. Take, you know, be open to taking that. He wasn't saying do it automatically, but 
you know, because it's not your, I got to be in that for 10 years. You know, it's a step toward what you'd love to do someday. So he said, just when that, that door opens, look at it carefully. Don't just say, well, it doesn't fully align with what I, what I was hoping to, to get. Yeah, but two of the five parts or three of the five parts are really strongly aligned. And yeah, maybe I'm going to take that risk. You know, I'm going to go in there and do the best I can with that. And uh, you're right. You, you go down that path, right? And you find a few years later, oh, my third iteration in the same maybe organization. But now I'm here and I'm, I'm much more aligned because they saw what I could do and so on. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. yeah. For sure. For sure. So. I mean, that's all great if you're working for a company that's willing to explore new roles and all that kind of right. stuff. But let's say that you've explored all the opportunities within your organization and decide your skill sets don't align. What steps yeah. can you take to find other opportunities? Yeah, that's always a tough one because I think sometimes we are a little slow on that. Mm -hmm. I know I probably stayed in one place, one setting a little too long and didn't look sooner. You know, it's, it's hard, I think, especially for people who may have been around for a while. And in a particular place, I was around for about 15 years. And yeah, I did different things within it. But just the idea that I might not be doing something different inside now, it might be outside. And it was hard for me to go, wow, I've been walking in this place for 15 years. Is that reality? And actually, it took me a couple of years to really come to grips with that that was reality. I really do need to leave. So I'd hoped, and looking back, I probably should have done that sooner, maybe within six months to a year. But it is what it is. But I, th I just want to give that word to people who've maybe been in a place for a long time. It feels really risky to step into something new. So I think first you need to come to grips with that. Are you willing to do that? Uh, you can use all the social tools that are out there, all the investigative tools. There are organizations, there are places that are great like yours that can help recruit certain folks for certain kinds of work. It's definitely go and explore that. It's definitely talk to people who know people who know people. Uh, I just joined a group of people there's about 15 of us. It's a little mini network of people who are just in the know in a variety of settings. And it happens to be for a uh, search firm in a particular niche. But even though I don't work in the niche, these people are really wise. They, they picked a lot of us because we're not in the niche, but because we can see people who have some of the abilities they're looking for in that niche. So they're, they're not so, so narrow, they can only work in healthcare, for example, or something like that. They just, they just have a kind of person they're looking for at a certain level of director and above, et cetera. But um, what, it, what it made me really think of was, am I networking with people and am I looking at potential connections that are not 100% lined up with sales or with finance or whatever? Uh, am I willing to, to, to look at something bigger, broader, that that's just going to be a piece of? Yeah, you need the financial ability to really read a balance sheet and do all that as a CEO, but you don't need to be the CFO. So, you know, sometimes a person needs to look a little bit outside their, maybe not their target if they really feel passionate in something, but be open to what that next circle out could look like. So I would say, you know, be open, keep looking at your network, going back to people in your network. I just sent an email out to some folks saying, hey, I'm doing some new things and I just want you to know. And I might lean into you for some advice, some feedback. And I got 120 responses saying, hey, this is great. And I mean, and just in the sense of, I'd love to talk with you, not because I would sell them anything, but it's sort of, I'm available to have that conversation with you on how you can take what you're doing further. That's 120 people that are willing to give me feedback and input and who might know someone who knows someone, just like you said, it's someone else down the chain who's going to go, ah, right, and, and have that insight. So that may not be super specific. Um, but it, it is about people. I think most of us get most of our work through people, especially mm -hmm. once we kind of get up and going. And so let's look at the people we already know and really talk to them. It's not unusual. Like my wife found a job for my son, not looking for a job for my son. She was working with someone somewhere. They got in a side conversation. He said, oh, I have this center. It's kind of part fitness, part health club and other things. And we're always looking for some good people to do some minor management things. It's like, uh, I have a son that's looking for a part-time job and he's, I don't, I don't know if it'll fit or not. And he's like, ah, I sent him our way. Now he's running the customer service division. Wow. And you go, where'd that happen over a three or four year period? It was, no one was even looking for a job. They were just in relationship and they found a connection and, and someone passed a name along. So I go back to where you were before saying, meet people, know people, listen well, uh, put yourself out there and be willing to serve others. Yes in ways that are maybe outside your, you know, I, mean, I have a family member, more distant, but a family member who, if they don't get the job, they won't take a job. 
And it's mm. like, don't talk to me. I'm sorry. You know, I just, I, I get frustrated with that. They're so narrow in what they're willing to do. It's almost against their pride, you know, like, well, I'm worthy of this. Well, they're offering this and you have nothing. <laughs> so uh, it's that kind of, I started to get frustrated. I'm sure you guys run into that kind of thing once in a while. So. Quite a few times. Um, so in, in this kind of, I think leads great to the next question because, um, you know, it's, I think it's really what I'm hearing you say. It's about knowing what you want. Well, you've got to know yourself, right? right. And you've got sure. to know what your passion is. And that's going to require some soul searching and some inner work to be done, which is great if you can find a coach to do it with, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say that after, after a period of self-reflection, you determine you don't have a certain skill that's necessary for career progression. What, what steps can you do to improve that skill? Yeah, I think um, this this comes to a, really a deeper question in some ways. It's do I have, first of all, the innate competency to do a certain thing? Sometimes mm -hmm. we just can't do something, and that's a truth moment. It's just the reality of, you know, we've looked around. We're trying to improve the, the skill. Can I? But, I you know, I don't have it. If I have a sense that I just need honing of a skill or – I've tried something, I've gotten sort of B minus feedback on it. Yeah, maybe I can do that better. Uh, but I go back to chemistry for me, no matter how hard I tried. Yeah, in uh, college, I thought I could, would be a doctor someday. So you had to take organic chemistry. Well, I struggled through regular chemistry and taking organic was just awful. And it's just my brain could never get past, you know, Na plus Cl equals NaCl, which is table salt. That, that I got. But it was this long molecule with different shapes and sizes and you put it under heat and it creates a, a gas and you take that gas and you cool it and that produces this. I was like, what? You know? So I realized it's just like, I just don't connect that way. Mm -hmm. I sat on a school board where half the board were there because they had representation with a certain group. They represented a constituency. And it was good to have their input, but they weren't strategic thinkers. So when we started to do strategic planning, they were way down in the weeds. We're thinking, should we add a new wing and put a biology, you know, lab in and chemistry and science lab, or should we build another site that students can access? We're up here talking. They're like, how much are the textbooks? Uh -huh. And that's not a bad thing. You need people to think about that. So I, I say all that. Say sometimes first check is, is it a skill I just don't have? You know, then let's get real with that. But let's assume I do have it and I want to improve it. I'll go back to you know focusing on. Things like, what's my style? You know, what? how do I actually learn? What's my learning style? If mm -hmm. I want to improve on a skill, there's probably seven different ways to do that. And I need to know, back to your comment, I need to know myself. How do I learn? Am I a watcher? Am I a do and feedback person? And I know there's situa situational leadership training that uses some of that thinking, but uh, I, I worked with a really high-end physician. And when he wants to learn something, he locks himself in his office with a stack, a foot and a half high of journal articles and books. And he just does that for five or six hours because he's going to find what he needs to be looking for at the microbial level or whatever. Um, but that's his learning style. And I know others I've worked with who are, I need to be in the room and show me kind of people. I need to go on the sales call with you. Uh, so part of it is what is the skill require? Is, it, is learning it uh, have to do to learn it? Or is it just you can read about it, you can take a class on it? So I do see people wanting to enhance their skills and they go take a class. I'm not saying you should never take a class. It's just that out of 12 weeks, maybe two of them really fit to what you really went there for. And, and it's too broad and you spent money and time and all that. So what's the style uh, of learning that will help you acquire the skill based on what the job is asking for? So sometimes jobs, and you know this, some people don't post really specific jobs sometimes or the descriptions aren't great. Let's say someone who's good at making sales calls, technical sales calls, you know, are we selling footballs, are we selling biology equipment? <laughs> uh, is it cold calling? Is it, you know, there's a lot of different things there and I may have the skills to do some of that and not do others. So getting real clear on what it is you're looking for, what does the job require is one thing, I think. And then... Um, figuring out learning style. So some of the skills that you would need in relational environments, you might need to do some role playing with people. You know, do a sales call. And then what do you get pushback? Well, let's try this. And I was with Procter & Gamble. That's all we did. You know, you do a sales call, they go back in the car with you and go, why'd you ask this question? Okay, yeah. on the next call, I want you to try this question. Now go do that. And they give you feedback. 
That's awesome. I love learning that way. You could give me 10 videos in a sales manual and I would never learn it anywhere near as fast as I would with someone with me in the environment. So I want to encourage people to really think, what is the nature of the skill I want to learn? And then what's the best way to learn it? Can I do that? Because I think there's a lot of different ways to learn things. Experiment, try, feedback, you know, watch videos, whatever. I, I think that's such great advice. And again, it goes back to knowing yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Know the best mm -hmm. way that you learn. Know what you're wired to do internally. Like you're not wired to do chemistry. I am not wired to do chemistry either. Um, so I totally get that, together, yeah. <laughs> nor do I sing, even though I would love to be a singer. So, and that's just not my skill set. So this has been a fabulous conversation. I have so enjoyed it and thank you so much for your time today. Sure. Um, yeah. but we don't let anybody go without hitting our VIP questions. Oh, uh -oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully they won't be too hard for you. So and I can make one more comment before we get there. Yeah take too much time. It, it was related to this uh, a little bit, but I want people to hear that when they're, you know, looking like, is this the right job to even be looking for? You know, is it worth pursuing it, when, when they find out maybe my skill's not there or whatever? Is it the right thing? And I just want them to be able to look at the categories of skills too that are necessary. And I know you work a lot with, with this kind of thing, but is it mostly about communication skills? Is it mostly about uh, process skills? Mm -hmm you know, like how to lead a meeting and how to solve problems and do decision-making together and guide a team through a process. But sometimes you'll see, again, a brief description. You'll think, oh, I can do that. But the way that gets done is a lot of process and a lot of relationship and a lot of time and a lot of coordinating and collaborating. It's not just about knowledge and then stating some facts and having people go, okay, we'll do it. It's not that kind of environment. So I think, is it heavy communication skills required or the process skills required? Is it really technical? And then the last one is how, what, what are really are the specific job skills? Just to go make sure you may have to call and ask in some way, go unpack this a little bit more for me as I look at this opportunity. So what's it look like for success when someone's doing that job? And the more they talk, the more you'll either go, yes, or you might go, oh, oh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, I wanted to add that to my other comment. Thanks. Oh yeah. So that now give me your scary question. <laughs> They're not scary. They're just fun. <laughs> okay. And thank you for adding that because that, that was definitely a valuable add on. And, you know, we talk to candidates all the time that are, you know, just applying to everything. And we're like, what do you want? Don't do that. It's not like, you know, throw as much spaghetti up against the wall and see what sticks. Doesn't do something help. that's going to make you happy and that you're passionate about. So. And everybody needs to throw some, you know, food on the table sometime. I get that. But you got to have a plan B going over here while you do that. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three okay. things or people would you take with you? I think more people comes to mind. And the first one would be because of the movie Martian. I want Matt Damon with me. Oh, dun, dun, dun. That's two he for is. Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know what? I, I, I think about this and I think, uh, again, I think categorically. So one is, and my wife would be sad if I didn't name her, but my wife is one of the most discerning people I know. So she's the slow person. I'm the fast person. Mm. I'm the, uh, I'm going to be a little more like real quick, impulsive, maybe sometimes decision-making. And she'll say, have you thought, and if you're on Mars, you really need people to go, have you thought yes. about <laughs> oxygen? Yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, but she is, she's very discerning. So I'd have her because of her wisdom and her ability to take information and not always be technically smart but asking the right question another person that comes to mind is a, like a bill gates type oh. uh watch documentaries on the way he goes at a problem i mean a big problem if you're talking mars here we're talking big problem big challenge is really being able to separate data from uh process and if, uh, being able to know the sources you need to draw from and how do you get the right people in the room and how long do you need to work the problem and brilliant person but I was impressed with how much work he does. As smart as he is, he does so much work. And I think I'd love that person. And the other one's more of a, he's a buddy of mine named John, who's um, part MacGyver and part just roll up your sleeves and serve before you even ask kind of guy. Like you need something done. He's already halfway doing it before you even ask him. I mean, those kind of people, salt of the earth. But he's really good at, I would call, living life skills. You know, he can just, 
everybody else needs books and academics sometimes to get to things. They don't say, no, you just need to put that over there and put this thing here and move that furniture over there and the whole thing's ready. And you go, you're right. Uh, so he's able to take whatever you have in your hands and make really cool stuff with it or experiences out of it. And he's a great cook. Oh. He's an incredible cook. So I get two for one. There you I go. Who can cook for me while I'm there <laughs> and solve some of those kinds of things. That's so, anyway, awesome. that's what I think of. That's awesome. Okay. So this is my favorite question. I like all the questions, but this truly is my favorite one. So what is one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? Yeah, probably what a number of leaders do. And it's the whole idea of some people call it something like getting centered or whatever, but it's some time to do around three themes. And it's the three themes I train the coaches in. I don't just do that because it's tactical. It's what I live and do. And the three words are story, soul, and strategy. Mm. And um, I mine I look into, I dig into my story. And that's both as a leader and as a person. So I'm looking each day, each week, how did I get here? What am I learning? What's happening? Um, where have I come? So there's a bit of a, if you want, a thinking and assessment and reflection on that. And it's just digging more into the story. And I think there's a lot of great learning in our stories. And sometimes we ignore it. And we go to book learning or other forms when we just need to look at the, go to school in ourselves mm -hmm. and what's been going on. Second thing is, and I say soul is, you know, what's going on inside me? Who am I? What am I becoming? What kind of person? And that's time. And I've heard some of your other speakers talk about this. It's time of meditation or reflection, prayer, the places where you just come and center and, and you make sure you've got space and away from the chaos where your soul can be filled. And maybe you do some reading and that fills you, or maybe you watch something and that fills you, or you listen to, I like to listen to certain music and it may change based on my mood but music does something to me. So in that soul piece, I do that. And then strategy is more, not just strategic, but it's more, where am I going? You know, where, where am I taking this story and this soul that I'm cultivating in a direction? So what lies before me today that needs focus and where are my priorities in that? Not just time management, but more, where will I place the energy that I have? Cause I don't have limitless energy. Where is it worth placing with whom and with what? And so in some form, I'm doing those three kinds of things in a, in a practice every morning. I love that. And I, I love that it goes just a little bit deeper than just meditation because you're doing your story, which is your reflex, reflection. Right. Sorry about that. And then you're doing your, uh, so your, it's story, soul, and strategy. And strategy, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. beautiful. And I have an ebook on it, not pushing it, it's free. But if people want it, it's about nine or 10 pages. But it's, it kind of lays out how you do that with a leader and how you oh. love, help them mine their story cultivate their soul and then move strategically into their future as a person for success. So. Oh, that's beautiful. That's yeah. a little gold nugget right there. Yeah. Um, so we'll be sure and include that in the show notes on how they can find that. Um, okay. okay. So my final question is if your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? It would be something like this, I think. Uh, and you know, it from the book titles I've had, he changed leaders so they could change lives, you know, or Bill changed leaders so they could change lives or something like that. I, I'd like to think I can change, or I'd like to think I could change the world, but that's a big deal. But I know I can touch a life that may touch a life that may change the world. So uh, transforming leaders who transform the world, something like that. The headline would have something like that in it. Yeah. That's beautiful. How do people find you? Uh, DrBillDonahue.com. So it's just DR for doctor, uh, Bill Donahue, D-O-N-A-H. There's if you put an O in there, you may get some weird people. <laughs> you may get in trouble at work. <laughs> dot com. Yeah. And it'll tell you how to get hold of me. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I have so enjoyed this conversation. And I just have one last thing to say to you. Okay. You are a VIP. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. Thanks for your uh, invitation to be part of this. I've really enjoyed it. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.